Today our session, as you can see, is called Computer Updates, Windows 10 question mark, El Capitan, that's a Macintosh thing, question mark. And I believe most of us are here because we're wondering whether we should go with those or not. So the goal today is to answer those questions and hopefully you'll go home with those answers and not too many new questions. Our presenters today are from the Division of Information Technology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I'm happy to introduce Angela Tarab from the help desk and <laughs> Brett Vlock over here from our tech store. And they're here to give us about 45 minutes of presentation with a few opportunities for questions interspersed. And then we'll have plenty of time after that for a wide variety of questions. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you all for coming. It's great to see such an awesome turnout. Um, again, I am Angela Tarab. I work for Do It at the help desk. Um, and welcome to Computer Updates, Windows 10 and El Capitan. So if you're here, it's probably because you're curious about these new operating systems. Um, maybe you've seen pop-ups for them and are wondering if it's a good idea, um, if it will um, help you do what you do on your computer better, or if it will just get in your way. Um, so just to start us out, I'm wondering how many of you in the audience use PCs or Windows products? OK, so quite a few. And how many use Macs? Okay, all right, so a pretty good spread of both. Well, great, um, so today we're going to talk about, um, let's see, we're gonna talk a little bit about some background on the two new operating systems, Windows 10 and El Capitan. Um, we're gonna be talking about sort of the look and feel, what you can expect when you turn on um, a computer with these new systems, some of the new features that they've rolled out for these new systems. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about if you're interested in upgrading, what sort of system requirements are you going to need? Um, should you upgrade? Is it something that will um, benefit you with your particular needs? Um, and then how would you prepare for an update and where can you go for more help? So those are all some things we're hoping to cover. Um, for the format, I'm gonna be starting us off talking about Windows 10. We are then going to have Sorry about that. We're gonna have a short break for questions about Windows 10, um, and then Brett will come up, talk about El Capitan. Again, we'll break for questions, and then we'll talk about the installation process and have some, some time at the end for more questions and a wrap up. All right, so that um, brings us to Windows 10. Um, so this is Windows' newest operating system. It was released in July 2015. And Windows is offering a free upgrade for all um, current Windows 7 and Windows 8 users to Windows 10. They're pushing it out through pop-ups, so if you're using one of those systems, you may have noticed um, on the bottom right corner of your screen every so often, it, it suggests upgrading to Windows 10. Um, and some more information about Windows 10, it is being marketed as the last Windows operating system. So from here on out, um, what Microsoft is saying is that they won't be releasing a big, um, a, a big package of features every few years. They won't be releasing another OS. Instead, they are going to be continuously updating um, and pushing new features into Windows 10. So in theory, if you upgrade now, um, you will have the most recent Windows features going forward. Um, with that, they are phasing out their other operating systems. So Windows XP is no longer supported by Microsoft, um, and they're winding down support for some of the other systems. Um, so Vista extended support um, is ending in 2017. And what extended support is, is the security updates. So um, when hackers find flaws in the system that let them get in, Microsoft releases a patch. They update the software so it's secure. Um, and that's the, the type of support that's going to be continuing um, a bit longer on some of these older operating systems. So with Windows 7, that's continuing until 2020, and Windows 8.1, um, 2023. Okay, um, so now to situate Windows 10, we're gonna look a little bit at Windows 7 and 8, um, the 
to previous operating systems. We're just gonna look a little at what you would see when you turn it on. So with Windows 7, um, what was rolled out is sort of the classic desktop when you turn it on. So it looks a lot like um, Windows systems of the past. It was a very sort of familiar feel, look and feel for PC users. Um, features were found in the start menu. Um, there was your power options, search, um, control panel, other, other features that users access frequently. For programs, you can pin them to the desktop, pin them to your toolbar. Um, this was generally a pretty well-received operating system. Most PC users found it pretty intuitive um, based on what they'd previously seen with other Windows products. Um, then Windows 8 came out, and it was a bit of a different story. Uh, so with Windows 8, uh, Microsoft rolled out this new tile view for their desktop. Um, so you turn on the computer and you see something that looks a little bit more like um, what you would get with a mobile device. They have their programs displayed as apps, and you can add new apps to your desktop from the Microsoft Store. Um, so what Microsoft was doing with this, they had just released the Surface tablet, and they were looking to have one operating system that would be universal between tablets and PC. Um, in theory, that's a good goal. In practice, it was a little clunky for some PC users. They um, were not seeing the features that they expected on their desktop. You can switch back and forth between this tile view and a more traditional desktop view, but then um, it was sometimes missing some of the features that users expected, such as some of the start menu features. Um, so it generally was not folks' favorite system, which Windows took into consideration when designing um, Windows 10. So the start screen for Windows 10 uh, looks um, a little bit more familiar. It's again sort of a return to that classic desktop where you have, um, you can pin programs to your taskbar, create your shortcuts on the desktop background. You still have your start menu accessible on the lower um, left hand corner where you have your control panel and all of those. And the Windows 8 style apps are still there, but they are just features in the um, start menu. So um, you can work without using them. It's not a feature that you have to use unless it's something that you find helpful. Um, so it, it's a bit more familiar, sort of a return to form for Microsoft, but at the same time, there are some new features with Windows 10. Uh, one of the big new features is Cortana, which is Microsoft's personal assistant, sort of like Siri for um, iPhone or Apple products. Um, Cortana is, will respond to um, speech if you have a microphone. You can ask her questions or you can just type in questions or search terms rather than searching just your computer like previous Microsoft search functions. Um, she'll look on your computer and the web and most impressively, she is integrated with other Microsoft programs. Um, so that would be Outlook, if you have that, for calendar or email, Skype, um, Word in, micro, uh, in Excel, perhaps. So you can say things like, hey, Cortana, schedule me a meeting for 2.30 today, and she can do that. And again, as with any of these services, she is collecting information on you. So the more you use Cortana, the better she gets, but also uh, Microsoft is building a profile of you, so there might be some privacy concerns for some users. Um, it's sort of a matter of, is this service useful enough for you to justify the information you're putting in? So that's something um, you can consider when using her. Other new features, um, OneDrive, Microsoft's cloud storage, um, was rolled out with Windows 8.1. In Windows 10, it's, um, continues to be integrated. So Microsoft is encouraging you to save um, your documents and photos to some of their server space. So it's on the cloud. Um, with OneDrive, you get five gigabytes of storage. You can save items directly from your uh, Microsoft programs onto the cloud. Um, it functions similar, the saving function is similar to how you would save something to your desktop or another documents folder. So it's pretty, um, pretty intuitive for users. 
Uh, the other new, another new feature is Microsoft Edge. This is Microsoft's new browser. Um, if, for the long time, Internet Explorer was Microsoft's default browser. You may be familiar with that. Edge is, um, it's got sort of a more modern design. It has a larger viewing window. It's supposed to run a bit faster than um, Internet Explorer. And it, it's rolled out a new feature called Right on the Web. So there's um, a little icon in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. You can click on it. It'll quick save a view of the page you're working on or you're looking at. And you can add notes, edit it, save it, send it to a friend. Um, so they're really trying to make, make it easy for you to um, save and send content in web pages. Uh, Internet Explorer is still going to be loaded onto these machines, but Edge is the new default browser, um, particular to Windows 10. There's some accessibility features. These aren't necessarily new. Um, however, Narrator for Windows 10 is a bit more robust than it has been for past Windows operating systems. Um, so in the past, it was sometimes limited to reading only Microsoft um, pop-ups. Now Narrator can read just about any web page um, or text-based document. It does very well with most um, sort of standard text-based documents. Um, another accessibility feature is possibly voice controls with Cortana. So uh, as I said, you, if you have a microphone, you can talk and your computer will respond to you. So that might be a hands-free mechanism that would be, could be useful. Microsoft has continued the Ease of Access Center, which was present in past operating systems, which includes features like the magnifier, um, high screen contrast, or turning off um, the display or keyboard use for accessibility purposes. Um, so that's a little bit about what you'll get out of Windows 10. Um, then we're going to talk about what um, you need to install Windows 10. So the system requirements, um, you can check if your computer meets these in um, your system information. Or um, the one thing that I would say you might want to look out for is the, the hard disk space. So to install Windows 10, you need 16 to 20 gigabytes of free hard drive space. Um, so if your computer is getting low on memory, you probably will not be able to install Windows 10 at this point, or you'll have to clean out some files um, to do the installation. And then finally, um, should I upgrade? So the answer to that is it depends. It depends on what you're using your computer for um, and whether you are happy with what you have now. So um, some suggestions are you, Windows 10 might be right for you. Um, if you are really interested in having the latest Windows going forward, the new features sound interesting to you, you think that you'll get use out of running a, the, the current operating system. Uh, it might be right for you if your operating system is no longer supported by Windows. So if you have XP, that's no longer um, a secure system. The, Microsoft isn't pushing out those security updates. Um, unfortunately, if you have XP, the Windows 10 upgrade is not going to be free, um, but it might be something to consider. Um, another thing is a lot of folks do not like the Microsoft 8 or the, the Windows 8 start screen. So if it's really driving you crazy, if it interrupts your workflow um, and you're not able to do what you want to do on your computer because of this operating system, then maybe upgrading to Windows 10 is a good idea because it is a little bit more of that classic look and feel. However, Windows 10 might not be right for you if you have low disk space, as we discussed, if your computer does not meet minimum system requirements, or if you're just satisfied with your current operating system. Some users have had issues with their laptops after upgrading to Windows 10. If the upgrade doesn't go well for whatever reason, sometimes folks have like lose access to their mouse um, or have other hardware or software problems and have to revert back to Windows 7 or 8. So this is not for all users, but you may want to consider that, that if there may be some hassle in upgrading. So if your system's working well for you, your um, Windows 7 or 8's working well for you for now, um, remember Windows 7's going to be um, maintained until 2020 with those security updates and Windows 8 until 2023. So in all likelihood, that's probably going to outlast your current um, device or just about there. So it's not something that you'll um, have to upgrade right away if, it's not, if you're not interested in doing so. Um, 
So that is a little bit about Windows 10. Do you have any questions for me at this point? Yes. The question was, what are some of the flaws of Windows 10? Um, I think most users who have been able to um, upgrade successfully have been pretty happy with it. Um, the problem is, again, when, if an upgrade doesn't go um, as anticipated and if you lose some of that functionality for your computer. Um, and I suppose the more, the more data and information is on your computer, um, the more you'd want to weigh that risk before trying to upgrade. Yes. The question was, do you have to have a Microsoft Edge account to upgrade? Um, you don't have to have a, an account with Edge, but you do need a Microsoft account. Um, so you are prompted for Microsoft credentials when you log into Windows 10. Um, so yeah, that, that might be another reason to not upgrade. If you're not interested in creating a Microsoft account, um, I, they, they are free, um, but if you just have too many accounts already and don't want to deal with that, that might be a reason not to upgrade. Yes, in the back. Okay, the question was, um, when Windows 10 was first released, there were some concerns about mining data um, and what, um, have there been any updates on that or what's going on? Um, I don't have any particulars for you. Um, as I mentioned, um, Cortana uses more of your personal data and will create a profile that Microsoft potentially could use for um, whatever purposes it sees fit. So there are definitely some privacy concerns with that. Um, I suppose in this, as with other systems that are integrated with the web, um, there will be ways for your data to um, get out there. Do you have anything to add, Brett? Yeah, the main concerns, mm -hmm. um, and I hope everyone's hearing me okay. Good. Um, we're with Cortana, and that mm -hmm. service can be disabled um, if you choose, and then that it is not being sent back to Microsoft. Microsoft's using that data to help Cortana help you guys all more um, to be able to assist you better. Um, and, and that's the primary concern, and it's a legitimate concern, and definitely feel free to disable Cortana and just use your computer, you know, as you would have used Windows 7 or Windows 8. Yeah, that's a great point. You can definitely disable um, Cortana. Sorry. Yeah, the question was, um, there have been rumors that Windows 10 will be an automatic update. It will be pushed onto your computer at some point, um, whether you um, want it to be or not. Um, I haven't heard anything to substantiate those rumors. Um, do you have any other background, Brett? Yeah, so depending on how you mm -hmm. have your updates, your Windows updates set up on your computer, if everything is automated, um, technically, this is a, a Windows operating system update. So it could come through, be downloaded automatically, and then go through the process of installing. Um, to prevent that from happening, you would go into your Windows update settings, and then you would select only update, um, only install updates that I say are okay to update. Yeah, the, the question was, um, if you do disable those updates, um, would you then be in the position of having to decide with each update, uh, do I want that, do I not want that? Um, yeah. And that's another great question. I'm glad you asked that. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, the Windows 10 update is incredibly specific. And if that's the one you don't want to happen, um, it's really easy to choose all of the others, which we would recommend you get. Um, it very clearly says Windows 10, you know, update. Um, so you would just choose not to get that one at that point. Um, and also in our handout, we've included a link at the end of the Windows 10 section that will disable the constant prompting to update to Windows 10. Um, if you have any issues with that, we encourage you to reference one of our, um, we can help you do that either um, at Do It um, at the help desk or else one of the other resources we provided at the end of the document would be able to help you do that if you don't feel comfortable doing it yourself. But that, that it could auto-update, that's true. That would be dependent on your Windows update settings. Okay, so with that, we'll have time for more questions on the end, but I want to um, pass it over to Brett to let him talk about El Capitan. Thank you.
Yeah, those are all great questions. Thanks for asking them. And we will come back and we'll open it up at the very end for more questions for Windows 10, as well as for El Capitan, which I'm going to jump into next. Um, so again, how many of you are Mac users? Good, OK, fairly represented throughout the crowd. And those Mac users, do you also use your iPhones and your iPads? Yeah, again, good representation. Um, so this past September, um, Apple released their latest version of their operating system, which they called El Capitan. Um, do you guys know what El Capitan is? It's a mountain, right. And in fact, that's now the default image uh, for the wallpaper um, of this new operating system. All Mac models that are 2009 or newer will be eligible for this upgrade. Um, there's actually even a couple from 2008 and 2007 that would be able to handle the upgrade, though I wouldn't recommend it if your computer is that old. It's probably going to slow it down a little bit, and it won't be able to take advantage of all of the new features in El Capitan. Um, but otherwise, um, El Capitan does have the same system requirements that the previous two iterations of Apple's operating system had, um, namely Mavericks and Yosemite, uh, which include uh, two gigs of RAM for your memory, as well as um, roughly nine gigs of free storage available on your hard drive or your solid state drive. Um, so what does it look like? Well, this was Mavericks. Uh, this was the operating system from two generations back now. Uh, it's a very classic look. It has that taskbar down at the bottom, Apple menu up at the top. Uh, and if you look, Yosemite, Looks very similar, uh, taskbar down at the bottom, a new wallpaper image, menu up at the top, and the current iteration, El Capitan. It got a little update with the new wallpaper page, um, but it's, it's basically what we'll call the classic Apple desktop. Um, so you could store all kinds of files on your desktop, put shortcuts in your taskbar, um, but it should be, if you've been using a Mac, what you're very familiar with already. Um, not a lot of changes like Windows had from going from a classic menu to then just this metro screen is what they called it with tiles uh, to then a hybrid, which was a classic plus tiles. This is all really familiar to Mac users, this interface. So what's included in El Capitan? Well, Probably the biggest thing that everybody really loved about Al Capitan was it sped things up. Um, it, apps were able to launch more quickly. Um, Apple claims that web pages will load 50% faster. Uh, Apple said that um, PDFs will open 40% faster. Lots of performance upgrades with El Capitan. Um, Spotlight. So it has better spotlight searching. So spotlight is just the, the built-in search function, um, similar to what Cortana is for Windows 10, except it's, n it's not a narrator. Uh, you just type in what you're looking for, and it can search the web, and it can search your computer, and it can search your mail. So I could type in to spotlight that I want to look for mail from my friend Patty uh, from back in March because I know we were emailing back and forth about a really important project. And um, Spotlight will pull up all of my emails between me and Patty in March, which is a really handy tool, especially if you're using the Apple Mail app. That's what you would have to do to make that work. Um, it can also search the web. I can find out what the weather's gonna be like for the rest of the week. It can search my transit options. I can find out um, what bus route to take from home to work tomorrow if I want to get to work at 10 a.m. It's a really handy feature built in. It's called Spotlight. Um, I hope you Mac users are already using it. Uh, and then enhanced multi-window um, management. So by pressing F3, 
every app that you have open at one time. So that might be Microsoft Word you've got open because you're writing a letter. And it might be your browser because uh, you have you know, your whisk mail open. Uh, and maybe you have a spreadsheet open in Excel. All of those things are open in the background. Uh, mission control, um, this, this multi-window management system, will pull those all out in sort of smaller increments so that you can see everything you've got open on your screen at one time in a really easy to manage function. And then you could simply tap on the one you wanted, click with your mouse cursor. Um, more. For cloud storage, so Microsoft Windows has OneDrive, um, and Apple has iCloud. Uh, with iCloud, you get five gigs of storage online in the cloud for free uh, with every new MacBook or iPhone purchase, anything like that. Um, if five gigs is not enough for you because you take a ton of photos, or maybe um, you guys have family members who send you tons of photos of their kids and school events, um, or you have a ton of music that you want to back up on there, um, or maybe just you want to be able to store a couple movies on there, um, you can get more storage. Um, to go from five gigs to 50 gigs, uh, it would be just 99 cents a month from Apple, and you could set that up. To go from 50 gigs to 200 gigs, Apple charges $2.99 a month. And to get a full terabyte of storage through iCloud from Apple, it's $9.99 a month, and that's 1,000 gigabytes. That's a ton of storage um, as an option. It's a great way to back up all of your documents, your calendars, and your contacts. Um, bookmarks, music, photos, you can back up all of those things in iCloud if that's something you want to do. Um, and you can access iCloud right through your system preferences. Uh, you would click on the Apple icon at the top of your screen. Uh, system preferences would be an option. And then iCloud is an option right in system preferences. And you just log in with your Apple ID and password. This is also a great way to sync everything that's on your phone, your iPhone, with what's on your Mac. So if you use, or also your iPad. And in fact, you could sync all of your photos, contacts, calendars, everything across all three devices just by turning on iCloud on each of the devices and logging in with your Apple ID, respectively. You should consider upgrading to El Capitan if. Um, and I'd like to recommend if you have a Mac model that's from 2012 or newer. And the reason I specifically say 2012 or newer is because Apple guarantees that every new feature in El Capitan will function on a model that's 2012 or newer. Now, you can upgrade older models from 2009 up, but not all of the performance features will actually, um, you won't be taking advantage of them. They won't actually be there. Um, so there's not as much benefit. Um, and the system's a little bit older, so it's just not going to run it as fast. Another reason you might want to upgrade is if you do purchase a brand new printer, let's say, or maybe you purchase a brand new digital camera, and that camera is compatible with El Capitan, that might be a great reason to update uh, to El Capitan so that it can really take advantage of the new technology. Um, the same would be true for new software. If you guys decide to get, maybe you've been running Microsoft Office 2007 or something, a little bit older of a version, and you want to update to 2016, again, it's really going to take advantage of features of El Capitan. It would be a great reason to upgrade. Um, and then the other reason you might want to is if you've upgraded your other Apple devices, um, and they're going to be optimized by using El Capitan as you sync across devices. Um, some reasons you may not want to upgrade, though, um, reasons you might just want to hold off is, you know, if your Mac um, is older than in 2009 specifically, just we strongly recommend you do not try to upgrade to El Capitan. It won't work well for you, and you won't be taking advantage of 
virtually any of the features that it offers. Um, or if you have older programs that you need to keep using, or older hardware, maybe an older printer, um, that you want to keep using, the compatibility might not be there with El Capitan. Um, and I know it's always frustrating when we have to upgrade um, to new devices after using one. That's been really reliable for us for a long time. Uh, and the other thing is you need to make sure you have enough space available. If you try to do this upgrade and you've run out of space on your hard drive, your computer, it'd be really sad, but it wouldn't even turn on. It wouldn't even be able to function anymore. Um, and I mean that in the fullest sense of that terminology. So don't do that. If, if you need help you know, finding out how much storage you have, please use one of the resources we provided at the end of your handout and um, we'd definitely be able to help you find that out. Um, and then the, the only other reason you might not want to upgrade is if you're really, really just happy with what you have currently. Um, you know, you guys, this is an option um, to decide whether or not you feel like you need the latest and greatest or what you have is sufficient for what you do. So with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. Yeah, yeah, so the question was, thanks for having me do that, by the way. Uh, the question was, um, does running out of storage um, affect a Windows computer if you're trying to do the upgrade as much as it does a Mac? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, at a minimum, on either a Windows or a Mac, you need to have at least 10% free storage at all times, um, just for the systems to run properly, for programs to run properly, um, and literally, if you fill up either computer, Windows or Mac, to full capacity, um, you run a very high risk of it not even functioning, period. The question was, um, a person has just purchased a one terabyte external hard drive to supplement their computer. Um, can they use that drive as extra space if they've run out of space on their computer in order to do the upgrade? And um, you can, so what, essentially what you would do then is you would move a chunk of maybe photos or videos off of your computer's hard drive and you would move it over to the external hard drive, thereby freeing up the space you need on your computer to push this upgrade through. That's what that would look like. Is there more questions about that? I want to be clear you guys understand what I mean by that. Sure, so the question was, um, what kind of hard drive should I buy if I want to do this? And also, aren't there wireless options, um, cloud options perhaps as well, that you could use instead? Um, and uh, probably the simple answer is, any of those options would work. Um, so you're right, you can have uh, a wireless hard drive set up. It's usually connected to your router, um, and it's, you know, you can move files from your computer to the wireless hard drive, almost the same way you do the one that you plug in with a USB port. Um, you're gonna see it on your computer listed as an extra drive, and you'll move files over to there to get them off your computer to free up storage. Um, you can also do the same thing with the cloud, which we talked a little bit about. Um, there was iCloud for Mac, and there's OneDrive for Windows. Um, you could essentially move five gigs of files to free up at least five gigs of storage for free from your computer to the cloud with one of those two options, depending on if you're a Mac or a Windows user. Um, as far as brands go, you know, it's, it's up to you. Um, we always recommend looking at reviews um, at the tech store. We sell Western Digital and we sell a brand called Lacey. That's L-A-C-I-E. Um, Lacey has a really great reputation for being incredibly reliable um, and very solid, but you pay a little bit of a price premium for Lacey brand. Um, Apple has their own brand. They call Time Capsule. And Time Capsule is a great investment. It's a wireless solution for an external hard drive um, that can back up multiple devices. You know, if you have your MacBook and maybe you have your iPhone, um, you could back them both up to your Apple Time Capsule. But the question was, um, 
if I move a bunch of files to OneDrive, which is Microsoft's version of the cloud, then um, does it look the same to go back to OneDrive and access it after I've done the operating system upgrade? And it does. Yeah, right here. Sure, yeah. So the question is, I have an Apple device, an iPhone, and an iPad over here, but I also have a Windows PC. Um, and can those two talk to each other? Um, are they compatible with each other? Um, and, and yes, in a lot of respects, they are. Um, and one of the reasons they are is because of Apple's iCloud. Um, you can download and install iCloud on your computer, on your Windows computer. And Apple has instructions on how to do this. Or if you don't want to download and install it, you can access it on the web. Um, and then you can log in with your Apple ID and password on your Windows machine and see all of those photos and contacts and everything you have in your iCloud right on your Windows machine. Yeah, so the question is, um, I had an old Mac and I've purchased a new Mac now, but I need all of the data from the old Mac put onto the new Mac. How do we do that? So there's actually a couple ways you can do that. Um, probably the way that all of you would do it is you would um, use Apple's backup software, which is called Time Machine. Have you guys heard of Time Machine? Can I get some nods or just no's? Okay. Time Machine is built right in to um, Apple's operating system. So the first time if you bought a brand new external hard drive and you plugged it in, Apple will automatically prompt you, do you want to use this as a Time Machine device? And what Time Machine is, is a full system backup of your computer. And then it backs it up to this external hard drive. And now what you can do is, so let's say we did that with the old computer. You can now take that external hard drive over to the new computer, plug it in, and Apple will recognize it has a Time Machine um, backup on it and ask you if you want to restore from that Time Machine backup. And then you would just say yes. It's a, that's a simplified version of all of the steps, but um, basically, that's what it looks like. And that's what I would recommend all of you do if that's relevant for you. Um, I don't know who's next. So the question is, uh, you've got the Apple uh, laptop now sitting in front of you, or, or iMac or Mac Mini, and you're getting the pop-up saying there's an update available. Can you stop those from coming through? Um, and I, I would just say that you probably don't want to do that. Um, what you can do is you can reject the upgrade to El Capitan, but you're going to want to get all of the other security updates. So when that comes up, it is important that you look at those um, and choose to get those updates. Um, we're going to open it up again for questions in just a few minutes, I promise. Okay, and then... Um, but we're just going to wrap up a little bit about what we've talked about. So if after everything you've heard today, a few of you have decided upgrading is right for you, these are the things I need you to do first. First and foremost, and if you don't do this already anyway, you guys should be doing this. Have a backup of your data. And that means, you know, either keep an external drive or create a cloud storage account or even, you know, use a third-party software program like Carbonite, you guys have probably heard of, or Backblaze, which are online services that can back up your entire system so that if something should happen, a fire or it falls out of a car or whatever happens, um, all your files are safe somewhere. Uh, and, and we want you to do that whenever you're doing a major upgrade as well. An operating system is a big upgrade. Um, and it's, you know, in rare cases, but sometimes somebody doing this upgrade loses everything. And that's really, really sad. Um, so we want to prevent that from happening. So do whatever you need to do to have a backup of all of your data before doing an upgrade. And make sure your device is plugged into a power adapter, especially if it's a laptop. Um, we've had it happen that in the middle of an upgrade, the computer dies. And again, that's a computer that cannot function now. You will have to take it to, an help, to a help desk or somewhere um, to get it functioning again. 
you will need a reliable internet connection. So make sure you're on Wi-Fi if you're, if you're in your rooms or um, make sure you're plugged in to Ethernet. If that's how you get internet, whatever you need to do, just make sure um, you have internet and then be patient. Um, if everything went perfectly smoothly with a Mac, you know, it can be up to two hours. Um, with Windows, the Windows 10 upgrade, I've seen it take overnight. You know, 24 hours isn't uncommon. It's, you know, it sometimes happens in four hours, which is great, um, but it can take that long. So just be patient with it. Um, one thing you definitely don't want to do is interrupt it and try and shut it down. Very bad. Like, again, you will have a computer that's not working if you do that. Um, and the other thing just to be aware of is that sometimes in the process of doing these updates, these big operating system updates, it needs to restart itself, and that's okay. Just let it keep going until it tells you it's done. Okay. Uh, so, upgrade versus a clean install. This, um, if you are feeling like you are advanced in your technology skills. So, uh, I don't know how many of you feel this way. Um, but sometimes um, people prefer a, what's called a clean install. It means completely erasing everything that's on your hard drive, getting a copy of the operating system you want, the new one, and installing it completely fresh, as opposed to installing it on top of the existing <laughs> operating system. If you're really technologically savvy, if you're not, you just want to go through the standard upgrade process, that pop-up that you're getting, the Windows updates. Yeah, do you have a... The question was, um, what if I take my computer into a help desk and I tell them I want the upgraded operating system? Should I also tell them I want them to do a clean install? That's really a matter of personal preference. So the question is, is that better to do a clean install than to do a, an operating system update of an install? Um, comment, if you take it to do it, then yes. Uh, so I would argue um, from my experiences that yes, there's a slight reduction in the chance of um, there being problems with the upgrade if you do a clean install. Okay. Um, but I, I'm going to have you guys hold questions again just till I get to that slide again. Um, so a clean install completely removes the old operating system and overwrites the hard drive. Be sure and back up your data again. Um, make sure if you had any special software that you still have that media because it might require you to reinsert, um, you know, product keys or installation keys, activation codes, things like that. You need to make sure you have those on hand or you might find yourself needing to go out and buy that again. Oh, the question, of course, was um, what do we mean by software installers? Um, what is that? So it really has to do with just your installation keys, your product keys, your activation codes that you get with software. Um, so when you purchased um, Microsoft Office 2010 back in the day, um, it came with an activation code. If you no longer have that code, and you don't have a way to retrieve it, you're probably going to have to buy a new copy of Microsoft Office. Or um, you might be able to contact their help desk directly to be able to reinstall that. Um, and then the other thing is you will need um, probably preferably a flash drive um, in order to do a clean install. Again, this is kind of for an advanced user. so. Um, I want to be sure you guys, if you don't feel comfortable doing this, you check with one of the support resources we provided at the end of the handout. Good. And so where can I go for help? These are these resources that we provided at the end of the handout. And this is not an extensive list. Um, Microsoft.com has chat, phone, um, and email support. You could go right to. They're a great resource also. Um, and there's an Apple store in town. A call ahead, make an appointment with, at their Genius Bar, I believe is what they call it. They'll help you with any Mac issues you have, but those are two resources we really recommend that you reach out to um, 
if you're otherwise not coming to the help desk or into the walk-in help desk at the tech stores. One moment for questions. Let me jump to, and there it is. Okay, here we are. <laughs> question here. The question was, um, is there any reason other than what we've talked about that we've heard about um, for not upgrading to El Capitan, the latest Mac operating system? And this probably applies also to Windows. Um, and the truth is, so in, uh, after its initial release in September 30th, there were a number of issues. In the first month when people were doing that upgrade all October long, yep, you know, their Wi-Fi stopped working, their sound stopped working, things like that happened. But Apple quickly turned around and created patches. So by November, 90% of those were fixed. You know, by December, 98% of those were fixed. January and February, we're not seeing any of those issues anymore, unless it's a really, really old system or something that just couldn't handle the upgrade. And a follow-up question? So the question was, can we assume that those issues we saw were um, on uh, an update for the operating system as opposed to a clean install? And yes, almost always, that's how it is. Good, back here. Yeah, so the question is um, about compatibility when you're upgrading to El Capitan and um, the concern that one specific software package might not be compatible and might not work. And what I'd like to say is that almost across the board, the majority of them are going to work. What you want to be thinking about is maybe a specific statistical package that you use for research that was, you know, written for a particular iteration of, you know, the Mac operating system. If you don't have something that specific, um, you know, Apple did everything it could to make your software packages work. Um, another example might be um, an old, old version of some sort of photo editing software that wasn't Apple specific, right? Or um, what else? Maybe uh, an open source, you know, office suite like open office. Sure, so the question is more specifically concern about an older camera being compatible with El Capitan. Um, and what do I mean by older? <laughs> so this is a convoluted area. Um, I just, I wanna say that and be really upfront about that. We would really wanna check online and you should be able to check, you know, just by Googling, is my camera compatible with El Capitan? Um, and then listing your camera model or the software program you have, um, it should be able to tell you really simply whether or not it will work. That would be my best solution to that question. Question back here. The question was, will uh, Photoshop, uh, I believe a version CS5, be compatible with Windows 10? Again, off the top of my head, I can't say definitively yes or no. I think yes, but I would want you to double check compatibility online now. If you Google, is Photoshop CS5 compatible with Windows 10? It should tell you right away. Yeah, so the question is, um, with all of ransomware and malware and viruses and adware and all of those bad words we hear about computers, um, do I need to get antivirus software or other protection for a Mac? Um, and I wanna start by answering this question uh, by saying, we see Macs, Mac laptops at the walk-in help desk every day that are infected with malware and viruses and adware to the point where a lot of times the students are completely locked out of their system um, and we have to clean it up. They cannot do anything, they can't even get to their email, they can't get to Word anymore. So yes, we're past that point where we can say apples don't get viruses. I know that used to be a thing. We're, we're very past that now. Um, so yes, you should get protection on your Mac as well as on your PC. Um, it's very important. Um, there's been some really successful attacks lately, including attacks that block you out of your whole system and tell you to call this number. And when you call that number, that person asks you for your credit card information and they want you to give them money. And we have our students falling for it and we have faculty falling for it. It's, it's really easy to do because you think they're solving your problem and they're not, they're making it worse. So 
please be aware that that's happening, and please do get anti-malware and antivirus software on your Macs. For your, yeah, so the question is, should I get um, an antivirus program or an anti-malware program for my iPad? Um, and we are, we're seeing more and more that um, mobile devices are being targeted now, um, especially as the up and coming generation, you know, it, I mean, they like live for their smart devices. Um, they really do. Um, so you're gonna see more and more that yes, you're gonna wanna look for solutions. Um, it's a little bit less of a risk, but um, I would say over the past week, I saw three cases where students' phones, their iPhones, had been hacked. Um, they were locked out of their account. As a result, we had to lock them out of their net ID access because um, the people who, who hacked their phone got their net ID and password, and now we're spamming out of their email address. I'm sorry, I don't want to give you guys horror stories. I just want to tell you what I'm seeing right now. And, you know, start looking for that kind of thing. Yeah, a question over here. Yeah, updates for 10 are free for Windows 7 and Windows 8 users. If you have an earlier version of Windows, like XP or Vista, um, then they are not free. Um, for the future, um, Windows 10 will be updated continuously. So if you have Windows 10, um, you will get those updates for free, um, most likely from Windows. It does, that, that's a very good point. Yeah, the free upgrade um, is set to expire um, July 29th of this year, so it was free for a year um, after the release date. It was released last July. If you don't like the upgrade, can you go back? Um, and the answer is yes. And Windows 10 actually has it built in already. It's pretty easy to revert back. You have 30 days to try out Windows 10, and it's still really easy to revert back automatically. Um, El Capitan makes it a little bit more difficult. You're probably going to have to go into the Apple Store or come into um, the help desk um, to revert back to a previous version of a Mac operating system. So the question was, um, with regards to you know, your account being hacked, um, can you get locked out of a Gmail account? Um, and I don't know definitively, but I believe yes. That's not something that UW is gonna be monitoring, that's something that Gmail is gonna be monitoring. And if they see that your account is sending out you know, tons of spam or uh, malicious attacks to other users, that's gonna trigger Gmail to put a hold on your account and get in touch with you to figure out what's going on. Sure, that's a good question. So, um, is it only emeritus faculty who have access to the help desk um, and the Do It Tech Storm walk-in help desk? Um, the emeritus faculty certainly have advanced privileges. For example, they can still make purchases of our educationally discounted computers and things like that. And I believe you would need to be emeritus in order to do that. Um, but my agents at the tech store and the walk-in help desk um, will help all of you um, to the fullest extent that we're able. So I, I wanna be real clear about that. If you're having a problem and you come in and see us and let us know you're retired, I'm not gonna have my agents ask you, oh, are you emeritus? No, that's not gonna happen. And um, we're, we're gonna help all of you to the best of our ability. And of course, it's UW um, affili former affiliates. Um, if you had no prior affiliation to UW, thank you, Kathy, then um, you would wanna seek out one of the other resources we listed, such as the Geek Squad, which you'll find at Best Buy, or going directly to the Apple Store, or um, reaching out to Microsoft.com, one of their chat phone or email options. So the question is, um, do I need to get a 32-bit version of Windows 10, or is it okay if I go with the 64-bit? Um, and if all of the software you've been using now is for a 64-bit operating system, then going forward, stay with the 64-bit operating system of Windows 10 as well. Good, I'm glad you brought that up too. I meant to talk about that um, when I started talking, but I didn't have it built into my slide. So the question was, um, if I wanna use Firefox or Chrome as my default browser in Windows 10, can I do that? Um, because you'll recall we talked a lot about the new browser called Edge. 
And yes, you absolutely can do that. And in fact, UW recommends Firefox or Chrome, Firefox primarily or Chrome, over Edge or Safari. Um, so those are, you can get Firefox and Chrome as free downloads and installs. Um, and in our experience, they're more safe and they're more secure than Edge or Safari. Sure, so the question was, um, I downloaded McAfee antivirus software for my computer, um, and is that sufficient for me? So, um, the answer really is, the main thing is that you have something, um, base level. Uh, there are, you know, different tiers. People would argue that Norton, also Semantic, they're actually made by the same company, um, are better even than McAfee. Um, so Norton antivirus software or Semantic antivirus software. Um, and that's currently what we use for active UW students, faculty, and staff. Um, but I know you guys would have to purchase it separately now. Um, and we would recommend that outright. So the question is, um, Windows 10 has a built-in antivirus software called Windows Defender. And is that sufficient? Uh, protection for my Windows machine. Um, we would still argue that Norton or Symantec are even better, yeah, more thorough options to have, but at a bare minimum, you want to make sure Windows Defender is turned on if you have nothing else. Yeah, so the question is, um, I'm going to upgrade from Windows 7 to Windows 10, and um, I'm concerned, will my documents and files have a different look in Windows 10 as they did in Windows 7. Um, and they really won't too much. Um, it'll be really similar based on the version of Microsoft Office, for example, that you have. That's what's gonna dictate the look of the icon, which is what you're used to. Um, it's not actually dictated um, by the operating system. However, it is, some of the icons change just slightly for um, Mac operating system changes, but you'll notice even those are like instantly recognizable. Um, those slight changes that they make to make them look slightly cooler, more modern. The question is, can I use Thunderbird as a browsing option um, instead of Firefox? Um, so when I think of Thunderbird, I think of a mail client, an email client. Okay, good. So um, some of you might be using Apple Mail? Anybody using Apple Mail? Yeah, okay. Um, some of you might be using Microsoft Outlook to manage your emails. Yeah, I see a few hands. Good. So Thunderbird is another option that is available um, for people who want to manage their email in a program. Um, Thunderbird, uh, one of the reasons we're hesitant about Thunderbird is because it doesn't actually take advantage of all of the new features that, um, you know, the different uh, mail clients have. So um, if you have a Hotmail account or a Gmail account or um, a Whisk mail account, unfortunately, Thunderbird isn't compatible with all of the features built in. Um, so you lose some functionality, but all of the basic functions are there, and you absolutely could continue to use that program to manage your emails if that's what you choose. That's a great point, let me reiterate that. So um, UW, since Thunderbird is not fully compatible with some of those new features, we've stopped supporting it um, at UW. So we would recommend you to go to another um, email client if, if that was you know, something you were open to doing. Um, and another fact Patty just made, which is really important, is that like Thunderbird, um, Windows XP, Microsoft has now deemed obsolete. And as a result, we've stopped supporting it now. So if you have a really old system, and, and the same is true so for some really <coughs> old Mac operating systems, um, Apple chooses to deem um, Macs older than 2009, I believe now, as, uh, what do they call them? Um, vintage, thank you. <laughs> 2009, it was a vintage year. Uh, I bet that wine is very good.
Um, yeah, and so we really can't support those devices much. We'll help you with some general troubleshooting if we can. Um, but ultimately, you might be looking at time to upgrade your device or your email client in that case. Yeah, so the question is, can I wait a year and see if El Capitan, you know, is an upgrade I want to do at that point? Um, and the answer is you absolutely can wait. Um, you should know uh, Apple's model is to release a new operating system every fall. So if you're going to wait a year, you're actually going to skip El Capitan and the next iteration will be available. And right now they only have a code name for it. They don't even have a, a real name for it, um, but they're talking about it. There's a lot of hype about it. So you can certainly wait though. Yeah, question back here. The question is, <laughs> thanks. Uh, what do we recommend for um, security, antivirus software, anti-malware software, for a Mac then? Um, since we've identified that it is, you know, Macs should have protection as well. Um, there's a lot of options out there. Uh, one of the ones we sometimes recommend to um, people in the retirement association community is um, to get AVG. That's just the letters A, V is in Victor, G is in um, good. A geezer, okay. <laughs> um, so that's a free antivirus software that's compatible with Mac um, and is, would be a good option um, for Mac users. Inherently, yes, new security um, patches were um, implemented into Al Capitan. So yes, it is more secure than its predecessor, Yosemite. <clears throat> Good, yeah, right here. So the question is, I'm using Outlook currently to manage all my email, and I've created some folders in Outlook. And historically, when I've had to move from a previous email client like Eudora or Thunderbird or something else um, to a new one, such as Outlook, um, the folders haven't come over and it's kind of been a mess and I don't even know where all my emails are. Um, am I going to have that problem again if now I do the upgrade to Windows 10? So if you're using a relatively current version of Microsoft Outlook and you go through the regular upgrade process through Windows updates to upgrade to Windows 10, theoretically, it's going to be flawless. Those folders will still be there and you'll be able to continue using Microsoft Outlook. Okay, um, so the question is, uh, my computer went through the process of downloading the Windows 10 file, um, but now I need to go and find that file. What is the file name? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, it, I don't think, I think Windows updates downloads to a specific location, um, and off the top of my head, I don't know the name of that. I would recommend, yeah, I would recommend contacting one of the resources we gave you to follow up with that question. Sure, yeah. Any other questions? We should probably wrap up pretty soon, too, so maybe just um, two or three more. How about over here? Okay, sure. The question was, um, can I comment on Office 365? Does it have... Um, how, what are the advantages? Does it make up for the hassle of installing it? Um, so Office 365, I would say some of the primary advantages are um, collaboration. So Office 365 is um, going to be more integrated with um, the OneDrive or cloud accounts you have. So if you're working on Office 365, um, if you have a document, you can easily share that with other folks you're working on working on it with. Um, you can work on it together in real time. Um, and then you can, in theory, um, access it as you would any other document on your desktop. So Office 365, um, the UW is using it um, quite a bit now for um, the, the Outlook accounts. So your email is going to be connected to your Office 365 account and then uh, if you are interested in using other products like Microsoft uh, Word or Excel, um, those would be integrated with Office 365 as well. 
Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, a computer uh, doesn't necessarily last that long, especially if you've had it for a while already, if you're running an older operating system. Um, so Windows 7, I think, gosh, it's been a couple years since they've even sold those. So it's already probably a little bit of an older computer. Um, and that you will continue to receive those security updates until 2020. Microsoft will be continuing to push those. Um, so you should be able to continue to use the software that you are currently using um, on your Windows 7 computer. And you sh if, if your plan is somewhere in the next few years to purchase a new computer, maybe you're just not going to upgrade then, maybe. So that, that would certainly be um, a reasonable choice. Um, especially if you're not planning on purchasing new software and aren't worried about um, new sw software possibly running into compatibility issues with your operating system. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, um, would you recommend AVG for PCs as well? Um, Brett had recommended that as um, a software choice for uh, Macs. And I believe um, with PCs, it was um, Semantic or Norton would be a recommended um, brand, as Brett was mentioning. I, um, yeah, I, I am not certain about that. Um, so we can. So Windows Defender is built oh, right yes. in yeah, as you, a Brett. free version of antivirus software. You could sub, um, you could use AVG free for Windows as well, though. That would work also. Those two are about on par with each other as far as the protection goes. Windows Defender is built in to your Windows operating system already and free and available to you and everybody else who has a Windows computer. Um, so you can use that um, if you don't want to purchase um, antivirus software. Yes, sufficiency is kind of a movable scale, but um, it's much better than nothing. The question was, how secure is your data on OneDrive? Um, and it, it is quite secure. Um, Windows definitely has an interest in making that um, as secure as possible. Um, so you should be able to access it um, for whatever time you need to access it for. I mean, anytime information um, is on the web, there's a possibility of hacking. Um, I haven't heard of any major hacks of OneDrive. I, um, but yes, that, that's a, always a possibility. Yeah, as with any account, um, creating a strong password is a great first step into avoiding um, hacking. We're gonna tie up our session for today. Lots and lots of questions, and if you have more questions, Remember this slide, so please go ahead and call the help desk, stop at the tech store, walk in, use the Geek Squad, the Apple Store. And then I want to remind you, everybody got an evaluation sheet. It's your normal evaluation for today, but also note it's asking you for ideas for the future. We really want your ideas, what kinds of things would be helpful in the future. So please fill those out and drop them off um, at the desk where you came in. Finally, I want to really thank Angela and Brett for coming and for Patty for organizing this. And we do have a little bit of a thank you gift for each of you. We have a notebook um, that's discreet at the same time as being useful from the UW Retirement Association. So again, thank you very much and thank you everyone for coming.